Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Karen Hartley Thomas, the hair, makeup, and prosthetics designer for Golda, starring Helen Mirren. Karen, you transformed this Hollywood icon into the Iron Lady of Israel. And I heard you had six weeks to prepare. So tell me about that meeting with director Guy Nativ and what were your thoughts about that timeline? Yes. Well, I met Guy, um, as you say, literally six weeks before shooting. And I desperately wanted to do the job regardless. I just worked with Helen um, on a film called The Duke. So when he offered me, I thought, right, we're, we're gonna have to start immediately with everything. So I phoned my usual prosthetic people who said, no thanks very much. We're not doing that in that time. Um, so I, I sort of asked around for somebody else and I found Susie at Red Girl Effects, who was a prosthetics designer as well. And she said, okay, we'll do it. I mean, it's very tough because we had a week, Helen came back for a week before shooting. So we started off the prosthetic, started the sculpt. I'd already got Helen's shape for a wig. So we started that, eyebrows, teeth. We just started as soon as we could do it. I had a chat to Helen and she said, well, maybe we can just do the wig and the eyebrows or maybe we can just do this. Or So we thought if we get everything as quickly as we can do it and test it and maybe discard some stuff, which we did do, and just really give it a go. So I went to Alex Rouse to start the wig and we sort of pulled over photos of Golda and got it together for Helen. And it was just kind of hit the ground running and do it really was like that. How many prosthetics pieces were there to, to, yeah. to change her? Well, there weren't as many actually as people think because Susie was very aware of, well, we've got two iconic women there and we really did not want to just transpose Golda's face onto Helen. We wanted to do as minimal as we possibly could. So we had a very small nose piece, two flat eye bags, cheek piece, and um, a half a neck piece. We did have a chin, but we discarded the chin and we had teeth and we discarded the teeth. So there aren't as many as you would think. And we used old age stipple as well, because even though Helen was the same age as Golda would have been at that time, she looked younger. So we had a bit of stipple around the eyes and also a little bit around the mouth. I so heard you got a full face of prosthetics, as people often think. And I heard you're so detailed that you even stained her fingers because Golda was a chain smoker. Absolute so massive chain smoker. Yes, we did. And that's why we had the teeth made. We made sort of nicotine stained teeth. But we, it, you know, poor Helen, you can only have put up with so much of two and a half hours in a makeup chair. So, yeah, we looked into quite a lot of detail with Golda. We were very lucky because her grandson was involved and gave us a lot of information on her. The texture of her hair when it was wet, um, that she would always plait her hair wet and then put it up into her bun. Just little things like that, that we could use. So, you know, it's it really advantageous for us to have that information. And there's actual footage, archival footage that they inserted. I out. know. Character into. <laughs> Talk about the complication of that, because then are you at that point trying to copy exactly as much as you can? Or what was that? What was the biggest challenge with that? Well, that was a tough one. When I saw that, I must say my heart rather leapt. <laughs> but um, even so, I still didn't want to just, you know, transpose the face of Golda onto Helen. I had to leave Helen. We've got one of the world's top actresses there and you you know you want to feel her presence and also it's comfortable for Helen with less prosthetic so we sort of almost went for an essence of Golda and hope it worked out that way but yes having the footage was a bit of a tough call. What is it like to have a prior relationship with someone does that change how you go into a project and and what is Helen like in the well, makeup kept, there? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question because it really did change everything. I asked to have a Zoom with her, with Sinead Kidal, our costume designer. And Helen has never had the prosthetics like this before. And she said, I'm not really very keen to do this. And I said, look, she said, let's just do the wig. So I said, well, look, let's give it a go. I'll make them. 
will make it so that it, you won't be, you'll be able to move your face. It will look natural. So we made, as I say, we made the pieces. So they sort of, they weren't connected. So we could have just used the nose. We could have just used the cheeks. You know, it's a matter of building up, but it definitely helped it because I think I talked her into it. I'm absolutely honest and said, let's give it a go and see what we come up with. So she'd okay, but I, I don't really think we'll use them. And then we did the test sort of a week before shooting. And she said, uh-oh, yeah, okay. We're going to have to use them. <laughs> so we got lucky. And what do you, how long is that process in the in the chair to, to do the hair and the makeup? What are you talking yeah. about? I mean, is well, she- two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, Helen would have her iPad there looking at gold of stuff all of the time. So there were two prosthetic artists on her, Susie and Ashra, and then myself and Annette would do the wig, the eyebrows. Helen put the contacts in, she had brown contacts as well. So it's, you know, it's two and a half hours, but then it's 45 minutes at the end of the day to get it all off. So it's, a, you know, it's a big commitment for Helen. And she was in every single day of the shoot. There wasn't one day that she had off. What are the technical aspects of creating a wig like that? For people like me who who don't know much about hair and makeup, you know, what goes into that? How long does a wig take to, to make? And that one specifically for someone of that age in that time period? Well, I, I was very lucky that uh, I knew it was Helen and I got Helen's head shape. So really, while it was all the deals were still being done, you get I sort of got the foundation made. And Alex has made Helen's wig for a long time. And I sort of phoned her up and said, I need a wig in four weeks. She said, Karen, I'm awfully busy. I said, well, I've got three little words, Dane, Helen, Mirren. And she said, okay. <laughs> so we went and looked at texture of hair because there's lots of distinctive characteristics of Golda, but definitely the wig is, the hair is a distinctive characteristic. So it's the texture of the hair that, you know, Alex and I constantly talking about and looking at. Eyebrows, we had to get the eyebrows made in the same way. So it's a lengthy process. We we we, were, we had Liev Schreiber as Kissinger, and we, as soon as we knew he was um, doing it, I sent over for a shape from Campbell Young in New York, who kindly sent it to me. And I think we made that in about six days in my team. But Helen's took, you know, I think Helen's took four weeks to make. It is about four weeks. Obviously, you like longer because you can make changes. And indeed, when we put it on, and we added bit more gray and a bit more texture so really it's always time to test that I'm looking for but on this job there wasn't much time to test and Golda clearly gets the most attention but you mentioned Liv Schreiber and there is a there's a whole cast to this film um so what sort of team do you have around you to to help with that and talk about some of the other work on on some of those other cast members that might not be as dramatic but was you know but they're real characters yes they're all real life characters so we had I mean we had a, a wonderful Israeli cast I have to say that I don't know I've ever worked with a cast that I mean Moshe Diane do you mind shaving your a bald pate in and dyeing the rest of your hair no don't mind <laughs> it was all like that and everybody had something you know we'd have people arrive the day before and make a tiny hair piece um Dominic who played Hem Barlev tiny piece sort of overnight it was a bit like that so all of them yeah we had a lot of real characters to match to but all of them were very willing to help and mostly we sort of got away without using too many wigs on them a few hair pieces but that was all what kept what kept you up the most at night? I mean, what was the most stressful part of all of this? Do you think, in terms of, was it the prosthetics? Was it the, was it the timing? I think the only time I sort of worried was in the prep stages for it. You do worry about that when there's not enough time for stuff. But as soon as we started, it actually was one of the nicest jobs I've ever done. It was a, quite a small team. You know, it wasn't a massive film and we had lovely people. It was like a family and everybody was incredibly supportive. You know, 
directed, directors of photography are so important and directors. Guy was very, very instrumental in all of this because we sort of thought, I haven't got time, Guy. I don't think we should be doing it. No, we're doing it. And we had a wonderful DOP, Jasper, because they can make or break it really. And he made it, I have to say that. He did, and in all of them, the design, and Sinead, because we had the legs to do, Sinead had a bodysuit to do. So it was a lot, but we all came together as a team. So as soon as we were up and running with it, it was quite smooth sailing. Well, it comes through on the film and it's really impressive work on Golda. Best of luck this award season. And thanks for joining Thank our Double Derby film makeup and hair panel. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Thomas Nillen, makeup department head for Killers of the Flower Moon. Thomas, this is a movie of epic scale from a legendary director and Martin Scorsese. So what were those early discussions like when you were approached to work on this film? And how much did you know about this story prior to getting involved? Well, I have to say I was in Switzerland at the time when I got the call from our line producer. It was uh, three o'clock in the morning, and I guess Daniel thought, you know, I give him a call at the end of the day, which would mean six o'clock in New York or, you know, or L.A. And, uh, you know, it took me a moment to realize what it was all about. You know, the Marty Scorsese is making the movies, Leo and uh, Lily Gladstone and Robert De Niro. And uh, I said, you know, even if I didn't have time, I would definitely make myself time to be involved in part of this movie um, because this was like, you know, a dream come true. And um, I have to say, I did not know anything about the Osage Nation. Uh, being born and raised in Switzerland, we we heard about the you know the the indigenous people, but we, I never heard of such a story, gruesome story. And um, of course, immediately I started while still in Switzerland doing research of the 1920s when this whole um, story took place. And when I got to Oklahoma a few weeks later, um, I. You know, we had this incredible research department from uh, one of our uh, executive producers and uh, Marion Bauer. She had an office filled with folders and pictures on the walls and books with headshots of the actual people and the photos of the people involved and uh, family uh, pictures and, and all of that. And that's how I started my research actually in Oklahoma a few, yeah, maybe four weeks before we started shooting. I had a couple of weeks here in Switzerland for the for the time period, color palettes and all that. But what it actually meant to get involved in shooting with telling this story was such a sensitive subject matter. So you really wanted to nail it down and uh, be authentic and real. And uh, we had incredible uh, people behind the scene, in front of the camera, behind the camera, who had a lot of knowledge about that. So we could, we got a lot of uh, feedback of that. And then, of course, uh, we had lengthy um, uh, Zoom meetings in the beginning with Marty. You know, the production office was like everybody sat in their office and nobody would actually leave their offices because this was at the peak of the pandemic. And so nobody, everybody had to stay apart from one another. And so we communicated via Zoom mostly. And then when while on set during, during the shoot, we had to wear masks, goggles, face shields, rubber gloves in the beginning to, you know, so we would, anybody who would be in close contact with the actors had to wear that on set, so. What was the most important thing for you to get right? To just to make sure you were historically accurate in representing this tribe during this point in American history and making sure you represented this community in a way that was respectful. In terms of like the makeup and hair, what was that time like and, and what were you determined to get authentically correct? Well, as I mentioned before, authenticity, I think was a key word. And because we all know, you know, from when I grew up, we had like Vinitu, Old Shatterhand and all these these movies that took uh, place in the West and uh, horse riding and like greasy uh, uh, characters and uh, with like red skin and, you know, and so the one thing we did not want to do is definitely 
uh, copy that. And after we had an incredible, um, we had incredible consultants that uh, knew very much about this particular, uh, uh, the Osage Nation. And of course, for me, it was important that every, you know, they had, there were, some of them were uh, more natural in terms of more traditional. And then we had, of course, the French influence, European fashion influence during the 20s because of the mineral rights and they found oil and became per capita the richest people in the world. So a lot of people had like would wear French clothing and, and fashionable makeup and hairstyles. And yet at the same time, they would always wear their blankets as a traditional thing. And uh, so we had to divide the people. We made groups like uh, the traditional ones, the, the fashion orientated ones, the town folks, the hoodlums, the men, the, you know. And for me, most important was that with, especially with Molly, uh, Lily Gladstone, that uh, during the movie, when she goes from healthy to, you know, almost dead, that we don't feel the makeup. So it's like natural. It comes across as natural. So we see, feel skin. And um, I always say that it doesn't mean that a no makeup look, there's no makeup involved. I mean, it's just as much, just like differently applied and, diff and even more so worked into the skin. So you actually feel you know, you don't have a barrier of makeup between you and the, the, the character. You can actually feel with the person and you can identify with the character. So you feel like you're you're close to that person, you know. And you're helping her through this sort of emotional journey, whether it's I mean, what how how does your impact as a makeup designer help push forward someone's emotional path on a film like I mean are with with the sweating or if she's crying you know how much can you help her along with that I mean you know it always depends on the on the on the actor some people they really they they don't they say like you know you do what you do you that's your job and I'm I'm not saying anything while other actors and I think in Molly's case it Lily um was definitely somebody who she looked at, she observed in the mirror, she looked at it and made it her own. And of course, it's a collaborative team effort. So you, you have discussions, we had makeup tests prior to shooting. How far do we want to go from when to when? Where would we start the, you know, the she's getting paler and the circles under her eyes and the, the sickness, the, the dry lips or the, you know, teary eyes and... Um, she was definitely somebody who um, made that her own, and I'm I'm pretty sure it it had an impact and helped her in her performance. You know, and talk about the team's work with Robert De Niro and and Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, you have to take Leo down a peg. You can't have a Hollywood heartthrob as this as this character. So, who's in charge of Leo's teeth? And and, and talk about some of those more intricate uh, pieces um, and, and people that worked with him on your team. Right. Uh, well, uh, Sean Craig has a longstanding working relationship with Leo and there's Carla White who did uh, Robert De Niro's makeup. So we, of course, had conversations uh, prior to shooting, you know, in terms of products that they would use in terms of uh, uh, what uh, what direction we're all going. So we're all on the same boat and we're all work on the same, as we all work on the same project. And in the beginning, it was sort of, uh, uh, I just remember that Sean had difficulties be uh, because of her working per visa. So mm -hmm. we basically started in prep with uh, uh, somebody else standing in. And I was asked to just in, in, in the worst case that if I could step in and take over until Sean would actually be able to come and join us in Oklahoma. And um, yeah, and then, you know, they went from what I understand through a lot of um, um, <clears throat> phases from, you know, like a full nose and teeth and, and, and nothing at all, or the main, from what I understand is the main thing for Leo was that he did not want to look like Leo, like the, the movie star that we know, as we know him. So he had to be earnest and earnest, and he wanted to 
to look different and unattractive and he i think that helped his character too and his performance you know and so they uh you know between uh kathy blondell who did the uh, leo's hair which is a subtle thing from i mean the haircut the first world war haircut and then changing from the side part to the middle part during the story where he becomes more sort of part of this whole family and then of course sean with the nose piece and he had like his teeth and his ears uh um pushed forward a little bit as did robert de niro just to resemble the characters that they were portraying more as we had you know images and photos that we worked from and how big is is the team overall that you have to work because this is a huge cast so how like how much time does it take for you to get through everyone on sets and make sure everyone is camera ready when when Scorsese, Scorsese says let's let's right. go well we I had in my main trailer and this is again it's because of it was the height of the pandemic so we couldn't switch makeup artists back and forth from like working with actors and then go maybe if there are not a lot of actors one day and then they work with the BG so we had to the BG people background people were primarily and only there for the the background people so we had to fly them back and forth from LA because there was nobody available in Oklahoma itself and in my trailer I had there was myself plus three makeup artists then we had an extra trailer for the the additional uh, act day players actors that came uh, on on numerous days not on a daily basis and then of course um uh leo had his own trailer and then of course robert de niro had his own trailer and because of the pandemic the idea was that we make up our people we had like a station there was a, a station empty station in between then we had a curtain in between like a plastic curtain so we could still see the other people but not like be sort of separate from them and um um where was it going with that uh, um so we had like the four people plus uh like seven people plus in the make in the bg trailer we had uh two main people and then plus additional 20 makeup artists well so we're, I mean, we're like close to 30 people at times <laughs> yeah it it shows in the film and, and how beautiful it is and how and how the cast all came together and Thomas, congratulations on some incredible work in Killers of the Flower Moon and best of luck this award season and thanks for joining our Gold Derby Film Makeup and Hair Panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Emmy winner Lori McCoy-Bell, personal hairstylist for Bradley Cooper and Maestro. Lori, congratulations on this film. It's gotten such a great reception from audiences and you've collaborated a lot with Bradley Cooper. So what were your thoughts when he came to you and said, I want to be Leonard Bernstein and I want you to come help transform me? <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, Bradley and I go back many years and it was about three or four years ago and he said, you know, I'm going to do this film, you know, Leonard Bernstein story. And I'm like, that's exciting. You know, so we knew way in advance. I mean, I knew, I knew way in advance because I was working with him, I think on, on the Guillermo movie, um, you know, during that time when he found it. So um, he, um, we just started to brain, brain, you know, just work together with our brains to, to, to start to figure out what we were going to do with the look. Um, and we started testing and it was, uh, it, it, it really evolved into something amazing because like he really wore a lot of prosthetics as well as, as wigs and Kazu came in and, uh, we tested for about a year or so and, uh, came up and he was Leonard Bernstein. Like it was, it was crazy to see the transformation. It was like what an artist really wants to do, you know, like it really, really hit me in a, a nice spot, you know? <laughs> good what, job. Was that, what was that first job you did with, with Bradley Cooper and what made him say, okay, you just come along with me for every, for every movie basically oh. now. Because, I mean, cause I, you work with him. I, I don't know how, how many films have you done with him together? It's, oh my it's gosh. I don't know. Like 
so uh, what what is that connection with Bradley that that you had in that working relationship? Well, I started working with him. The first movie we, I did with him was The Wedding Crashers. And I was okay. a department head on that, but I actually didn't even do his hair on that movie. My key did. And so the next film that I got to work with him was The Hangover, the first Hangover. So I, I still had the same key hairstylist. I said, why don't you just do Bradley? Because like you did him before and I don't, you know, he's number one on the call sheet. It doesn't matter. It, you know, he if it, who does what but you have the you know the relationship with him more than I do and he came in and he sat in my chair and I said okay well this is what this is what we're gonna do you know and like and after that it was just like I, I went everywhere with him and did everything with him it's just like our personalities clicked um my artistry worked for his hair and gave him confidence that he didn't have to worry about that on camera which a lot of you know actors and actresses want and need you know one less worry you know that they know that they're taken care of and it's going to be okay and we've just been on this journey on this ride that's been amazing to this point and now we're at maestro you know turned him into some turned him into Leonard Bernstein didn't even you know recognize him that opening shot is is jolting when like right at the beginning of the film, we see the aged version of him. So it really it immediately takes you away from Bradley Cooper and you feel like you're watching Leonard Bernstein. So, I mean, what what did you think when you saw that? What what do you feel when you see him transform on screen like that? You have to be proud of that and seeing that work. I am so proud of that. You know, like I just um, because we have a personal relationship on top of that, I just like, you know, really have a like I'm really proud of it proud of his work his dedication um but it still kind of puts me in awe to look at that on screen that opening shot that you're talking about with him on the piano and him playing he you know at the age of 71 and just every little detail is perfection from from the makeup and all the prosthetics that were put on to the hair, to the, to his performance from his, for his little nuances that are, that are Leonard Bernstein's that he studied in his movement. And, you know, all of that is just like, that's true art. And that's really an amazing thing to be part of. Talk about your collaboration with uh, Kazuhiro uh, on prosthetics. He's an Oscar winner. I've interviewed him one time. He just seems like the coolest person. He just seems <laughs> chill. Um, what what is that collaboration like for you? Is is he sort of working on him for hours, and then you come in to do the hair, or are you both doing things at the same time? How do how does how do you work together to to make those changes? It you know it um, most of the time I came in at the end at the beginning uh, at the beginning of the film or the beginning his youngest age of 25 years old. I had to do his hair before uh, he went to Kazu's chair to, and then Kazu put on some lifts that hid into the hair that was already done. And then I would get him again at the end. He probably was with Kazu for a couple hours because Kazu had pieces to put on. And, and uh, then I would get, then he would come back and I would just put the, uh, for the youngest stage, I had a, a toupee, just a small piece that went on his head that brought his hairline down uh, to look like Leonard's and um, and the rest was his hair and I just would blend it in and I would it would finish. So um, the other stages, there was four other stages for me um, and I would just, I had 20 minutes to put on the wig basically after he got out of makeup, he'd come up into my section of the hair trailer, he'd change, and he'd sit down and he was getting ready to go to set and be in director mode, you know, so that wig had to go on quick. It had to go on, you know, precise. And he was out the door and off, you know, at crew call, setting up the first shot. So our calls were very early to get him ready because um, the, the least amount of time it took was two and a half hours and the most was like four and a half hours depending on the stage like the the oldest stage obviously took the longest and you're representing a, a team here on our panel for us 
So Bradley gets the most attention just because it's such a massive transformation. Um, but Carrie Mulligan is also fantastic in this movie and she looks fantastic. And there's a whole lineup of uh, and cast and day players that are throughout the film talk about, you know, the team and and the looks they were able to do for Carrie, who goes through her own aging process and, and different changes. Yeah, um, you know, Carrie or uh, Kay Giorgio and Sean Grigg were the hair and makeup uh, department heads. And um, I know that Carrie had gone through several stages, like you said. Um, some of them were wigs and some of it was her own hair. The hair changed color during that time. Um, I know the huge cast of people all had little things done to them, you know, hair and makeup wise, and, and it had to show some aging and some time that had passed. And, uh, I, quite a few of the background people, I mean, there was more than 150 wigs used, um, and on, on, on the show. So, um. Yeah, no, it was very, it was a very busy show for them. You know, I was, I was kind of in just Bradley Cooper world or Leonard Bernstein world. Uh, Cause we were just totally on a different time schedule than them, you know? Um, but yeah, they, it was quite a bit of work that everyone put into and beautifully done as far as I'm concerned. Beautifully done. And you know, what, what, what does that research and, and pre-production process look like for you? You mentioned that Bradley had, talked about this film early on years before you actually began filming. So when, as soon as you hear sort of a mention, do you start sort of paging through things? Um, what's your process like to, to, and what's the most difficult challenge about portraying someone over a series of decades like that? Um, so immediately after he told me that, uh, you know, after he left my chair, after he told me that he was going to do this Leonard Bernstein, I immediately looked him up, you know, to remind myself what Leonard Bernstein looked like, you know, and, and started to think of like, that's quite a big transformation that he is going through, you know, I didn't know at that time, the script, how it was going to be. I didn't know that it was how it was going to be. And it, it was going to span for so many years. I didn't know any uh, of that particularly until it got later in the process with Bradley and I, and we would exchange pictures. And, and when Kazu came on board, you know, there was pictures of each decade and, you know, prosthetics took Kazu and the prosthetics took over for a while to get that perfected, you know, and then we finished with the wigs uh, on top of that and did quite a bit of testing. Um, I, I, what was the other part of your question? What was that? I forgot what the other. Oh, part I just, was. I was just asking how, like, what is the challenge of going over that series of decades like that? Yeah, the, <clears throat> well, each one, we just, each one was a stage for us. So, um, you know, we had a certain, a specific wig and specific um, prosthetics and a look that we wanted to achieve for each one of those periods. Um, Cause it went from 19, uh, 19, what was it? Uh, 25 years old to 71 years old. So there was times where we had to put lifts in his face and make him look younger than his actual age, you know, is. And then, then there was times uh, like stage one for us was his youngest look. And he, and I colored all of his, uh, temporarily colored all of the natural gray that he has in his hair to, to make it look young and richer, you know, like you were 25 and, uh, and then another stage, you know, I would let that gray come out and I would add a little bit of gray to it, you know, um, for, for years later. Um, it was quite, quite an undertaking and, and it was amazing to watch. I'm work, working with perfectionists. Bradley is a perfectionist. Kazu is a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist. So like all of our brains together, like if we weren't happy with it, we all had to be happy with it 100%. There was no, no chance for any kind of cheating or error or anything like that. Like it, we, we were in 100%. Well, it comes through on screen and uh, congratulations, Lori, on your fantastic work on Maestro. Best of luck this awards season to the whole cast and crew. And thanks for joining Gold Derby's film makeup and hair panel today. Thank you so much. 
Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Yana Carboni and Francesco Pegaretti, makeup and hair designers for Ridley Scott's Napoleon. This is a massive epic movie. It's nearly three hours long. I heard there's a four hour version somewhere. So clearly there was a lot of time and pressure <laughs> involved in this. You know, how do you start a pro how did you start even processing what you wanted to do for this film based on someone who's a historical figure? Um but but not someone who we have top of mind today. I mean, there there's portraits of him. So, but not like photographs. There's not video, obviously. So, how do you wrap your mind around just getting into this film? Well, um, I was actually um, designing Gucci when I was approached okay. from about Napoleon, and. Um, and I thought, oh, this is amazing. That's great. I love the idea. I mean, incredible story, incredible challenge. Um, but that was very early days. And um, and then I read the script. <laughs> and I read the script and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, this is epic. And when I say epic, I mean epic. <laughs> because in the script, we had basically 132 cast members, like characters, just in the script. And then uh, we had basically daily 500 extras a day. So it was humongous. And as you know, I'm pretty sure you know that really is fast, doesn't like to waste time. So we yeah. shot, everything, I think around in 65 days-ish, which wow. for a movie like, which is like four hours, and out in total is not much. So I started with the script and I thought to myself, okay, I have to get on board the right person for the hair. And I thought about Francesco because Francesco is an amazing talent. Her it was, yeah, it so was a it was you know, movie. And then when she called me, it, uh, she said to me, would you like to come with me to, to do Napoleon by Ridley Scott? I said, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, we work on the on the script together, and um, and then Ridley told me, oh, you know, uh, Napoleon is going to be working working Phoenix. I said, oh my god, that's incredible, that's amazing. And um, you know, of course, I knew about him. I saw his work, um, and that was pretty exciting. So I thought to myself, if working Phoenix is this this movie. I think I can go through all this humongous amount of work and uh, I really want to work with him. So I, you know, I kind of put my brave face and I say, you know, I can do it with the right people. Um, what was so that was like with Joaquin and, and him uh, shouldering this film? So it was interesting because the first thing Joaquin, uh, he said yes to the project, but, and then he was very worried, was very, very worried about taking uh, on board this kind of character because you know, it's, it's, it's a big, big deal. And uh, so the producers say to us, you know, quite early days, say to us, so me and Francesco, you know, Joaquin would like to meet you, both of you. Uh, can you go to LA for like three days and run some quick stuff and quick tests with him just to give him the feeling about what you're thinking and uh, where you want to go uh, with this character. So Francesco, he packed like a bag with like, I don't we know how many weeks. weeks to try on him, you know? We, uh, we coming from Italy. <laughs> yeah. And jump from the plane and we met Joaquin. Anyway, we start to chat and, um, and, but of course we went there, you know, very preferred because we have like a plan. We said to him, listen, we would like uh, to go with like four different looks. Um, what do you think? I said, well, you know, of course, I have to try stuff. So, of course, so we tried to, you know, try those things, those uh, different looks, and um, and then, you know, he. I think I don't know. I think he, I said to him, listen, I don't think we should go with prosthetic because I really think I can work with what I got uh, with clever makeup and I can transform you you with, with the right shading and the right you know colors I can do that and uh because it listen with Ridley you know the way you should you can't do that because on the day you have like you know 
five different scenes. So lots of different looks. So even so, we have to change, you know, different weeks, different looks during the day, like, you know, even three times a day. So we have to find, like, something which was practical, but even uh, effective and looking good. So we did those tests, and uh, he was really happy, but because they are, like, you know, like, rough idea. So we came back to to London, and um, I got a phone call from the producer say, oh, no, Joaquin is really happy. It's nice, but I'm more relaxed because I met you two and I feel more like, you know, confident about, you know, what it's going to do. Um, and so then... You two, so you two saved the movie. Basically, yes. That's yeah. basically what I did. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that on the day to Francesco. And I knew yeah. that. But I didn't tell you know him. Unfortunately, I didn't know anything about. Yeah, I didn't want Francesco to panic in. So I said, you know what? I'm going to pretend everything's fine. And it was fine, but you know, he wants to be sure, he, you know, he want to, what he want to be sure he was going to do the right thing. Uh, so that was quite important. And uh, actually, I had a good laugh as well. And uh, and then we come back to London and the producer say, listen, he is really happy, you know, is, you know, is very happy to, you know, actually sign for the movie and doing it. Was very happy with, you know, what you proposed to him. Um, and then they cast uh, Jodie Comer to do Josephine. So she's supposed to be Josephine. And uh, again, we go to uh, this uh, wig um, factory called Rocchetti in Rome, which you know, we have a very long story with them and we, we know since ever. So it's someone we really trust. And we make them making these wigs for Jodie. So again, we run some tests with her, with you know, with her wigs. And then because of COVID, we have to stop. And then after COVID, Jodie is gone because bless her, she had other um, I say other concrete. And she had to do like a beautiful theater piece. So she couldn't actually play Josephine. So we said, oh my God, okay, so what's going on now? So they took a while, yeah. So they took a while to to cast someone for Josephine, and then they cast uh, Vanessa Kirby. But we had, I think, we had like three weeks before shooting something like that. So we have make Five, yeah. like brand new weeks for Vanessa, and uh, I think we test her maybe ten days before start shooting. And again, that was a beautiful relationship because she came in with all her notes and we have all our notes. And then we start to plan together uh, Josephine's journey as a makeup and hair looks. And I mean, the, the, the women in the film have beautiful hair. I mean, it looks like artwork. So, yeah. I, it, so what was the, Francesco, what was for you, you know, what you wanted to portray on film for for the women and, and the hairstyles of that era. I start to study the, the portrait of the period because also we have two different periods in the movie. At the beginning, we see with the short hair because it was the period of, of the, after the uh, French Revolution. So uh, there is the, this woman saved uh, from the, the, the prison before the guillotine. And after, uh, when the, the empire start, they change, they created this beautiful hair, you know. So I start to to, to study and to, to see the paintings. And the, uh, we, me and Yana, we, we bought a lot of books <laughs> during the, the prep. And uh, yeah, I use a lot of wigs, of course, uh, for for uh, Josephine, but for Joaquin's mother, for Napoleon's mother too, uh, a lot of hair pieces for the crowd and for the other cast. And uh, yeah, you, I used also the, um, the you know, the hair, hair tongue to, to recreate the, the car like the period. And uh, we, I designed also a lot of accessories for the hair too, with Janti, also with the costume designer, we created a lot of accessories for the hair, uh, crown, tiara, and, uh, you know, and uh, so, um, I, I, honestly, I don't know how many weeks 
we, pre we prepared <laughs> for the movie. I, like honestly, I, I was uncomfortable, uh, you know, even for the men too, but uh, for the women, a lot of, you know, we, we was all during the day to prep for the day after because, uh, you know, a lot of parties and uh, the coronation scenes was very big to prep. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, just, just before I, I just have to ask before we go because we're short on time. So if we can just I just want to squeeze one thing in because um everyone talks about the 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 battle scenes and the war scenes. So what's the complication? Is there just hair and makeup flying everywhere? And maybe like a one minute summary of 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 what it's like to work on makeup and hair in these epic war battles. Well, it's about station i think a lot about to plan everything very well ahead even because uh ridley does like two three takes so in general not just for the battle everything has to look perfect 100 percent all the time you cannot risk to something not looking right because you don't have basically a second chance so it's really to do things 100 percent and always looking perfect and uh you know like Francesco and I, we are always on set, always, because, uh, you know, it's, it's important to be there to check everything's fine, because there's so many cameras, uh, it's difficult. 11, you know? we're oh. 11 cameras <laughs> during yeah. the Waterloo battle. Yeah, and the battle, we have like 700 extras. I mean, I was very lucky because we had with us uh, Julia Vernon. She was our, you know, crowd makeup and our supervisor. And, you know, she's a pro, she's amazing and she's very well organized and uh, she has an incredible team. So the yeah. standard was very high, very high. And uh, yes. and sometimes on the day, we even had like to change a huge amount of crowd because you can do like one battle and then switch to a different battle, which would mean different weeks, different look. Yeah, because, uh, you know, even each army is in different look. The, the Austrian soldiers, the, the you know, the Russian uh, army too. So in, in different periods. So with the weeks, without the powder wig, uh, with the short hair, long hair, messy, dirty, you know. Hold on. The hard work comes across on screen. And I mean, it's just, it's really incredible work. Yana and Francesco, uh, congratulations on your work on Napoleon. Yeah. Best of luck this awards season. And uh, thanks for joining Gold Derby's uh, film, makeup and hair panel today. Thank you so much for having us. I mean, it's been amazing to be with an incredible panel of artists. So, you know, we're very, you know, thankful and, and blessed. So thanks. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Jamie Lee McIntosh and Louisa Abel, the hair and makeup department heads tasked with creating looks for Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Uh, congratulations, both of you, on the success of this film. I'd love to hear from each of you how the film was presented to you and, and what was it intimidating going in knowing this is large scale, 70 millimeter IMAX production? Your work is going to be under a very close microscope for that. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> Get right into it. Yeah, yeah. right into it. Um, close up IMAX. Yeah, it's terrifying. Um, it was my first time working with IMAX and with Chris. Um, Louisa has many times, so she was a guiding force for me. Um, and it's just, I mean, you need to have an eye for detail in our, our line of work anyway, but in that world, it is extreme. And also, it has to look right in camera on the day because Chris is not going to be adjusting anything in post. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, it does help having worked on it before and um, also working with someone like Chris because uh, you're allowed to test very early on. We did a lot of tests on this to know the parameters of what we were dealing with, knowing what the close-ups were, understanding the black and white versus the color film. And uh, so that, all of that really helped. And when you're working on a biopic or a true story, um, how important it is is it for you to to get the character to look like the person they're playing how how close do you want to get them are you trying to get exactly there or do you just want it to be realistic where do you find that balance well that was one of the things we met up really early on and had um meetings with chris initially and then had meetings with the actors when they first went in for fitting so we were all there together 
And one of the things that was said was um, not that we weren't going to do lookalikes on this. We were going to make sort of a flavor of each character and then really make it so that the film is sort of believable, you know, without trying to go down that route. Yeah, I think because we're, it's, yeah, as you say, historical figures, we've got the period that we're focusing on and then the aging and, of course, trying to keep it as real as possible. So as Louisa was saying, it's like we would reference those historical figures and the period, but kind of just grab what we thought would be necessary to work on that specific cast member that yeah. we were dealing with. Yeah, we had a huge amount of research. So we were very lucky. We had many, many photos, obviously, of Oppenheimer and Kitty, but right down um, to all of the people in Los Alamos. So we knew really specifically what all of them looked like. And then we just went through with Chris and kind of picked what we could pull out that would give a flavor of all of the characters. And I heard Chris wasn't really into wigs. So haircuts all around. <laughs> yeah and trying to find things that will those haircuts and lengths that will work through that time span um so that also meant that any graying that I was needing to do or um hairline adjustments and thinning and things like that needed to happen on the head of hair that we had for that specific cast member so we used a couple of hair pieces when we had to um, but most of it was coming up with different recipes and techniques for each cast member, depending on how much gray we needed to add, how much, like what color we were working with to start with, and then the hairline adjustments as well. So all the cast had to fully lean into, into that world and they did, they loved it. Yeah, we had an interview with Killian and he said he'll miss the, the cast and crew of Oppenheimer, but he will not miss his haircuts. No. <laughs> I think he has been um, quoted as saying it's the worst haircut he's ever had. Um, <laughs> and I think I'll I'll just finish that and maybe correct it and say maybe the worst hairstyle. I think the cut technically itself was not bad. <laughs> was, was anyone the most complicated for you? Because Robert Downey Jr.'s look, I mean, he had a lot of changes to, to his hair as well. So talk about working with, with him and what you needed to do to transform his his look. Yeah, um, that probably technically was the most difficult for me, um, and because of keeping the continuity up on it. Um, Robert would also have decent chunks of time that he wouldn't be working, so it would be a whole kind of reset every time he started again. But um, adjusting his hairline, so taking that back, probably removing about a third of the amount of his hair through the top completely, um, shaving that right down, and then bleaching his hair through the top also. So I had the ability to go darker gray through to white gray, depending on where in that timeline we were. So that was just done with airbrushing and hand painting um, and just changing his style slightly. So when he's younger, it was more fluffier, to appear fuller and then when he we see him in his older um, stages it was more slicked back and you can kind of see through that thinning a little bit more so yeah and with the shooting in the black and white um, the contrast of his regrowth that would come through on the top mm -hmm. would show pretty quickly I'd get like a millimeter of regrowth and it would be like I could just see black dots <laughs> on his scalp so that was uh, staying on top of that was yeah it was a challenge it was good though I loved it <laughs> Louisa talk about the aging process and or de or de-aging process um that you had to do with the makeup on this film because you have I think I read it's like 17 or 18 characters that had to be aged because right, yeah. yeah so yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think overall we had like 73 speaking roles and then right. and obviously, you know, that's period and, and real people and then 18 agings. But within that, most of the characters had sort of three to five different stages of aging. So one of the biggest things that we did at the beginning was to figure out what the continuity for that was. So talk it through with Chris 
do tests so that we could get some practical visuals that he liked or you know what felt were close and then i we actually did some digital stuff so that we could show him kind of an arc a visual arc of what we could do for kitty you know and oppenheimer and strauss and then try to then do a, a blended group to ba basically be able to see all the people that age the most as a group and then start to work from there so then we just started doing testings throughout to kind of get these get this um, locked in continuity guide that so when we started shooting as Chris was filming everything in and out of shooting um, we knew exactly where to do all those pops throughout the five months that we were filming it and Did obviously I'm oh, sorry those those stages were you know right from making somebody look young with plumpers and neutralizing out all their skin and putting all the flesh back into their skin right the way through to having four prosthetic pieces and stretch and stipple. So it, there was a lot of detail in all of the designs and every character was, it was very specific what we used on them to make it seem believable on IMAX, right? So. And just looking at it every day and, and, uh, working with uh, Christopher Nolan, who just won Best Director at the New York Film Critics Circle. Um, so, I mean, awards awards season is is kicking off strong uh, for him and Oppenheimer. So, what what what's it been like just to see the finished product? You have to be extremely proud of the film. It's it's I mean about to cross the billion dollar box office mark. I think if it had if if it hasn't quite yet. So what has this been like to just be part of a film that has had such a tremendous response? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled. I mean, we're really thrilled for Chris and Emma and everybody. Um, I think the, the best thing of all of it is just seeing people's response to the film and knowing that we had the challenge of doing all of this on IMAX and knowing that we were having these tight, tight close-ups and people weren't taken out of it, that, that our job was to facilitate the story and to do that in a way that nobody came away sort of just thinking about what we were doing, but actually that it was, you know, just an integral part of the film. And then they thought about it afterwards has been really, really great. Well, Jamie Lee and Louisa, congratulations on the tremendous success of the film and your incredible work to help it all come together. And thanks for joining Gold Derby's film makeup and hair panel today. Thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> Welcome to Gold Derby's Meet the Experts film makeup and hair panel. I'm so thrilled to be joined by the best of the best in the business. With me are Karen Hartley Thomas from Golda, Thomas Nellen from Killers of the Flower Moon, Lori McCoy Bell from Maestro, Yana Carboni and Francesco Pegaretti from Napoleon, and Louisa Abel and Jamie Lee McIntosh for Oppenheimer. What a group of films and what a year for film. I mean, this is a, a really incredible lineup. I would love to just sort of discuss the directors that you worked with real quickly. Um, talk up Oscar winner Guy Nativ. Oscar winner Martin Scorsese, nine-time Oscar nominee Bradley Cooper, four-time Oscar nominee Ridley Scott, five-time Oscar nominee Christopher Nolan. This is who you all are working with. So that's bonkers. So I want to hear your perspective. How much is it? does the director impact your work as a makeup and hairstylist? And how is it, how important mm -hmm. is their collaboration for you? And I'll, I'll start with Thomas. You know, talk about working with Martin Scorsese and, and what's guidance you get from him and what he appreciates specifically about your work well actually after like three weeks of shooting i put the question out there um if marty likes everything we're doing and if he's happy because i hadn't heard anything <laughs> and um <clears throat> or didn't really get any feedback from anybody and then i asked at the line producer and he looked at me with sort of a, a weird face and he said are you serious and i said well i just want to make sure that we are you know that everybody's happy and everybody's on the same page and he said look the reason why you're here there's a reason for that and if marty wasn't happy with what you're doing you would have heard it like three or four weeks ago and the fact that you're here there's nobody here that is not supposed to be here so take this for an answer 
And I said, okay, I got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So no news can be good news with Marty. No news is good. was good news, yes. <laughs> and Yana and Francesco, Ridley Scott, same thing. This man's making epic after epic. He's 86 years old, a total legend. What was your experience with him and, and what's his approach to your work? Well, you know, I always say that Ridley is the youngest director in the business. <laughs> because he's so bold and he's so brave. Um, I mean, you cannot better than that. And for him, uh, image is so important. You know, he, you know, it's the first thing for him. And it's very visual, so he's a painter. So he took in terms of uh, colors and shade and, uh, and, you know, tones. So it's, you know, it's very intriguing. And I say, it's quite nice to have a lot of, freedom um you never you know you can always push yourself out of your comfort zone and do something slightly different and something maybe is not what people are going to expect and it's very happy with that um you know it's very bold you know it's a very bold director and as it's very young i remember when we're thinking about the victim ball when they have all this kind of pixie shortcut uh, i say to him now I'm thinking about the cure and said to me, oh, the cure of the band. I said, yeah. I said, that's a great idea. So we went from there uh, for something that actually is a period piece because, you know, as he said, it's not a history lesson. It's a movie. It's about imagination. It's about dream. And yes, you have to be of, uh, you know, of course, history kind of background. But when you know the history, you can do whatever you want. You know what I mean? You have to have the knowledge. When you have the knowledge, you can be brave enough to do something slightly different. And uh, and for him, he works, I mean, he's an amazing uh, drawer. So he draw to you whatever is talking to you. So he say, you know, I want this to look like this. And it just in five seconds. And you have exactly what he wants. So, you know, it's, it's a great privilege. I mean, I feel very lucky artistically, you know, so it's great. And Karen, you have a younger director in comparison, but he's an Oscar winner for his short film Skin, which I thought was brilliant. And he's Israeli. He was focused on getting this film right for Golda and her family. How important was that collaboration with him? And what do you look for in a director to make a film successful? And, and what's promising about his career? I was literally our driving force, there's no question about that. As I said earlier, he was the one that pushed for us to go for the prosthetics. He was so enthusiastic in every department. He definitely brings the crew together, all the HODs, to, to feel you're part of a team. And he's very, very keen on the artistic and creative element of it. Not all directors are. And at the same time, he's very, very supportive and understanding. So, yes, definitely, guys, one of the best directors I've worked with. And, Laurie, Bradley Cooper is an interesting one because he's got his hands in everything here. So you're you're the only one that's not working with a director. You're literally putting the makeup and hair on the director of the film. So um, what what type of energy does he bring to the set as as a director? This is his second feature. He's clearly in his in his wheelhouse. I mean, it's it's an impressive film. So what is he like as a director? And have, have you seen evolve throughout all the years you've worked with him? Yeah, I've seen I've seen quite quite an evolution of Bradley Cooper through the years as you grow and you get more experience and you know your energy can go uh into where he is now. I mean, he is um very collaborative. He he uh, expects 100% honesty, uh, you know, there, and, and we speak in those terms. So, um, and he has every, he, everything he, he's very organized. He has every shot, exactly what he wants to get. I think he's already shooting that. Like he already is cutting that in, in his mind. So we don't shoot unnecessarily scenes like he, you know, amount of takes because he knows exactly what piece he wants for what 
I've never worked with someone that was so organized, so focused, and so 100% in. I mean, all of the directors here that we've worked with on this panel are amazing in their own ways, and they all have their own way of doing it, you know? Um, so my experience with Bradley is it's easy to work with him. It's easy to work with him. He's very transparent. He tells you everything you need to know. He wants to collaborate with you. He wants your opinion. And uh, we're all on the same page and, you know, in all of the departments of, of the film. And we we make great art, you know, that way. And, and it's great that he's so approachable and no question is, is a funny question or an odd question to him. Like he'll fully, um, you know, answer anything so like he's really easy to talk to and work with like it's amazing can't wait to see what he does next yeah and Luis and jamie last and certainly not least we've got christopher nolan here what is the energy that he brings to set and and could you feel on oppenheimer of him just working what what's his collaboration like with you and making everyone feel the way they do on set yeah, I mean, it was my first time working with Chris and it was a joy. He is incredibly collaborative. Communication is fantastic. So because we're there to facilitate what he needs, he gets that communication and his needs to us and we, so we can understand what direction we need to go in. And it makes you feel incredibly supported. Um across the board I and I mean he runs a tight ship it's all very smooth you know what's going on and that's just it feels good yeah he's very um detail oriented he's always by camera so and he cares about everything so he's very aware of what we do he's technically very aware of what we do um and he's very decisive so a lot of the choices that that had to be made are made during prep so he he knows what he wants and he communicates that in a in a very direct way. So it's actually very easy to work with Chris because he really knows what the vision is for his film. So we're really there to facilitate um you know that for him, you know. You know, I'm I'm curious as makeup and hairstylists, it's it's a craft that's clearly in in the film business, but there's also makeup artists and, and hairstylists that don't work in, in film. And I'm wondering from each of you, what sparked that interest in you to be a part of film or television? Was there a, a, a film that you saw that you were like, wow. I mean, I remember the first time I recognized makeup was probably Freddy Krueger. I like that's, that's my age. Yeah. Um, but is there a film or an artist uh, that that inspired you to get into this field? And and what age did you decide? Yeah, this is I want to be in the film business, not just doing hair and makeup. And I'll I'll start with you again, Thomas. Well, one of the one of the few the first movies that had a big impact on me was The Sound of Music. Okay. It's a musical, and it was so fantastic. I loved the music, and I loved the just the vibe of it all and the happiness and the cheerfulness, even though it was a, a problem, but like the Baroness, I loved her, her character, how she was portrayed. And of course, Julie Andrews was wonderful. I just love musicals generally. And, uh, but why I really wanted to become a makeup art because I started with acting school and decided acting wasn't sort of my thing because I, I never felt really comfortable in front of a camera or, or, or on stage for that matter. And I was always more the, the the one who would peek through the curtain to make sure that every, that they look great and they get the applause and they get the attention that they deserve for the character that they're portraying. And um, in the film world, as a makeup artist, you definitely have a voice. You have an impact. You can help the actors uh, for with their performances. Like I did a movie here in Switzerland, like four years ago, after 25 years, the first time. And I got a, I won an, a, for, from the Swiss Film Academy award for that. And then the, the lead actress, she wrote me this wonderful letter saying that, you know, I thank you so much. Congratulations. 
Thank you so much, not only for your beautiful work and all the wonderful products that you used on me, but also the mental makeup you gave me to help that really helped me to get into the character. <laughs> and I thought that was that says it all for me. I mean, I, I don't need any more than that, you know, as long as I can be, it's like being of service. At the same time, you can be creative. It's collaborative team effort. You meet wonderful, wonderful people. Um, all around the world I've been everywhere basically hardly ever in LA but you know you learn a lot on a daily basis and you have to interact with people and you have to um, be clear of what you want you know Francisco how about you what you, you know what sort of films do you remember or what inspired you to get into the film business uh, doing here Probably uh, Moulin Rouge. <laughs> I, mean, I like a, a lot of Moulin Rouge, I think. It inspired me a lot. And uh, when I saw this movie the first time, I was 18 years old. Uh, they said to me, oh, this is beautiful. I'd like to, do some, to be part of this world. But uh, honestly, I was born in the in this world because my mom, my mom, my mother, she's a, an air designer too. And so I started to play when I was very, with the hair, when I was very, very, very young. But the movies that uh, really inspired me from the at the beginning, I, I think it was uh, Moulin Rouge. And Karen, how about you? Well, my family are big film viewers. We've always loved watching film. And when I was about 13, a film director moved opposite my house. And he asked me one day, would you like to come on the set? I jumped at it, of course. And I just remember at 13, I can't imagine what was going on in my mind, but I thought now then, this doesn't seem to be like work. This looks like fun. What should I try to do? So I, he introduced me to all of the departments and I went into makeup and it was a television series, I think it's called Survivors, about people living underground and there were lots of prosthetics and aging and wigs. So I thought, right, that's what I'm going to do. And I thought, how am I going to do it? So I applied to the BBC as soon as I could when I was about 20. And yeah, I've loved it ever since. I actually don't ever think, I feel like I've done a day's work, if you know what I mean. It's just an amazing, amazing world to be a part of. And I feel very privileged for that. So you know incredibly young, like 13 years old. 13, is... I know. Wow. Well, I, I can't didn't... imagine my 13-year-old self being so sort of, now then, hang on, what am I going to do on this set? I, I don't did. think I even thought of a job when I was 13 years old. No, I know. Uh, <laughs> I was old before my time, clearly, wasn't I? <laughs> um, Louisa, how about you? Um, I think probably the MGM movies, you know, like old, old movies. I really loved them when I was younger. And um, going into film, probably, I think the detail of the work, you know, knowing that whatever you do actually does matter that it really does get seen and being able to tell stories i i definitely feel that with films you get to do that um and the old movies they really sort of i i loved watching them so you know it's a different time but i i think that that's what inspired me to go into it and i was probably about 17 when i really thought i could do it you know and how did you get on your first set well, I started off initially actually in theater. I did, um, I worked at the um, English National Opera here and uh, did theater. And then I moved into movies. So I ended up meeting somebody that I worked with and I uh, just went on from there. Jamie Lee. Um, well, I started in the salon and knew that that was going to probably at some point bore me to death, maybe. Um <laughs> I knew I wanted to do something else and I watched a behind the scenes film called Full Tilt Boogie which was behind the scenes and making of From Dusk Till Dawn and I just thought it looked like so much fun I was just like what do I need to do to make that happen so I just started taking the steps to to do it. And Laurie how about you? My story, I think, is a little different because I didn't set out to work in the film industry. I mean, I at 13 years old, when I got my first professional haircut and at Vidal Sassoon in Beverly Hills, I'm like, I want to be a hairdresser. And and, you know, in high school, I went to 
beauty school um, and finished up when I graduated high school. And I was working at 18 years old, like as a hairstylist and loved it. This some of my clients just happened to be like a writer or director and things like that. So they asked me to work on some short films that they had. And, you know, I thought, oh, this is exciting. I could go and, and, you know, work in the film industry or make a video, I think at the time, you know, but, um, and it just, things just started coming at me that way. And it kind of, I decided, let me see where it takes me. I'll leave the salon world and let's see what this door that keeps opening for me will, will present to me. So, um, I, I went for it, but I, I was a little bit older. I was 30, you know, 30 by then. And so um, it wasn't something that I aspired to do at a young age, like some of our panelists. Um, but I like all kinds of movies. I like, you know, Breakfast at Tiffany's for a period film and beautiful stuff like that. But I also like The Exorcist. And th I thought that was amazing, the makeup in that, you know, and 73 and like, and Elephant Man, like things like that are just so interesting to me. And um, I just go, you know, here I am. I'm on a ride. Here I am now with the lovely people here on this panel and, and appreciate being here. And Yana, I understand that you come from a lineage. Yeah. So explain that. The fourth generation. So, um, well, very similar to, to Francesco, you know, all my mom family used to work in, is working in the business. I mean, my mom was a costume designer. My granddad was a director. Uh, but of course, because of that, I didn't want to be in the, in the business. So I went to um, art school and I want to be a painter. It was my idea. So I was to art school until uh, 20. So I did all my degree and uh, my idea was to just be a painter. And then I remember my mom said to me, well, you know, you have to earn some money. <laughs> so I said, okay. And uh, my brother uh, was um, second ID on a beautiful period movie of uh, Giuseppe Tornatore. Um, called uh, 900, The Legend of the Pianist. Um, and he said to me, oh, you know, why you don't come with me to, you know, to meet the makeup and hair people, you know, they're so cool. You know, I quite kind of like prosthetic was kind of my thing. But I didn't know anything about prosthetic. It was just like something I quite like. So he said to me, oh, you know, they are doing a lot of aging. It's so cool. You should come over. I said, okay. And he said to me, oh, you know, by the way, we have to wake up uh, four o'clock in the morning. I said, what? <laughs> I said, yes, because, you know, the actor they're on the chair, like, at four o'clock in the morning. And again, my family was in the business. But I said, I always keep myself for myself. I didn't actually want to know anything. So, funny enough, I was, like, more an outsider. Um, so it took me, like, a week to decide to go with him because I was... Uh, very shy I mean really shy very introverts and uh, I said okay I'm gonna do it so I went with him and I remember like you know he introduced me to the makeup designer who was Luigi Rocchetti and to the hair designer who was Aldo Signoretti and I remember sitting like in the corner looking at them and then I thought oh my gosh this is magic what they're doing I mean they're really transforming those people and said, this is actually what I want to do. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, it helped back that in that room, they were the best of the best. I mean, like Aldo and, and Luigi, they were incredible. So I was looking people perform their job at their best. Um, so I said, you know, I'm going to take the courage. I'm going to ask them if that can be like a trainee for them, hold them, you know, clean the table, you know, brush the whatever. So uh they say yes of course you know you can you know come here just help us so i did all the movie as a trainee but to be honest i mean it didn't pay me so it was for free so i worked for that for like not for that for the production for like you know i would say three months solid and i think in three months i think probably i say one word i didn't talk all through the time 
because I was so intrigued about what they were doing. And uh, and then I thought, you know, I really would like to do that. But as I say, I wasn't very outspoken. So I thought, you know, probably that's it, you know. And uh, and there were other people around me more outspoken. So I, I thought if they have to pick someone, they got to pick the public and, you know, chatty people instead of me. And at the end of the movie, actually, they came to me and they said to me, oh, you know, we really would like you to join us in the next job as a trainee. Of course, you're going to be paid. Uh, and these are started. I mean, I think it was quite good for me because of my art school. I knew how to sculpture and not a new art to paint. So it was a good background to go ahead. Um, you came a long <laughs> way since then. And, and then I was quite happy with my parents, you know, when I said to them, oh, actually, I want to work in the business, say, what? <laughs> so I had to really put like a brave face and say that to them. And about the movie. We have, uh, oh, we have to wrap right there. But sorry, we're out. Of, we're out of time. But I just want to congratulate everyone once again for each of your incredible films. Golda, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro. Napoleon and Oppenheimer. Best of luck to all of you this award season. It was such a pleasure to have you on Golda Reese Film Makeup and Hair Panel. And um, we look forward to seeing what happens throughout this season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.